We are your hosts, Nikki Shore and Jesse Swain, and you are listening to the American Journal of Infection Control podcast, Science into Practice, brought to you by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology to highlight work published in our peer-reviewed journal, HIC. Join us as we speak to those in the field of infection prevention and control, like us, as well as other experts to learn about some of the latest research in the field and how it can be put into practice. We hope you will listen in, learn something new, and apply this information to your work. If you are not a researcher already, we hope this podcast will get you thinking about areas where you can carry out your own research. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of AGIC Science into Practice. I am Nikki, joined by my ever-inquisitive co-host, Jess. Jess, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty great, actually, Nikki, and I'm ready to dive into today's topic. I mean, we're talking about post-exposure prophylaxis today, or PEP for short. Who doesn't love a good pep talk, right? Oh, absolutely. Pep talks are great, but pep that actually saves lives even better. Speaking of which, I've got an infection control joke for you. All right, bring it on. I'm all ears. Okay, here goes. Did you hear about the nurse who got bored in the sterile processing room? No, what happened? Well, she started telling jokes, but they were all so clean, no one got infected. <laughs> hey, bum, 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 bum. Oh, awesome. Always keeping those good jokes coming, keeping it clean and healthy, just the way we like it. Now, on to the real reason we're here talking about the PEP line, a teleconsultation cons- service that's been helping healthcare providers manage exposures to bloodborne pathogens for nearly a decade. We're lucky to have a fantastic guest to help us get into the nitty-gritty of PEP and all the things healthcare professionals need to know to stay safe in experiences of the National Post-Exposure Prophylaxis Hotline, PEP Line, Occupational PEP Consultation Needs and Trends 2014-2022. to Now I'm going to introduce our guest, Carolyn Chu, is Chief Clinical Officer and Principal Investigator of the National Clinician Consultant Center, or NCCC, an educational resource and program that operates multiple federally supported teleconsultation services for providers. Founded in 1993, the NCCC remains committed to offering low-barrier, person-centered guidance on HIV, hepatitis, and substance use and advancing health equity. Dr. Chu completed a family medicine residency and clinical research fellowship at Montefiore Medical Center, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx, New York, and previously served as medical director for a large network of community health centers in New York City. She is a professor of clinical family and community medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and a care provider at San Francisco General Hospital's Family Health Center. Welcome, Dr. Chu. Well, thank you for having me. We're very excited to have you with us today. So, Dr. Chu, um, your article explores the utilization of the PEP line, a teleconsultation service operated by the National Clinician Consultation Center, NCCC, to support U.S. clinicians in managing bloodborne pathogen exposures. This study retrospectively analyzed 67,109 PEPLINE consultations, that's a lot, from January 2014 to December of 2022, focusing on occupational post-exposure prophylaxis for healthcare professionals. The PEPLINE has been crucial in supporting clinicians with managing post-exposure prophylaxis or PEP. So 67,000, that is a lot of calls. Let's start by talking about something that really stood out in the study, the delay in initiating PEP. We know it's important to start it quickly, ideally within two hours, but what's causing these delays? That is a great question to start off with, um, Jesse. And I, you know, ultimately, I think it's a lot of, um, you know, really very kind of systems level issues and hiccups in the processes. And, and I think kind of speaks to the variability in, um, in, you know, just how health systems are set up, the fact that some hospitals 
um, I think, kind of uh, outsource, you know, their post-exposure um, evaluations to some extent. And so, you know, even like the employee has to get to a physically different location to be able to get that initial PEP evaluation. Um, and and honestly, I think there's um, some wrapped up in terms of maybe employees not knowing what to do um, sort of after they might have experienced a needle stick or an event. And, you know, I think we we hear a fair bit that um, people are kind of timid or hesitant to to let their supervisor know that something might have happened because they don't want to be seen as or that they you know they're going to get in trouble or something like that because um, there's a fear that they might have you know done something wrong which is absolutely you know not the case really but mm-hmm. so I think there ultimately is a lot wrapped up and so it's sort of like well um, you know no one's going to know that someone's had an exposure unless the employee really sort of takes takes it on themselves to let someone know and then once that happens then it's really about getting someone to to the first evaluation and then you have to have the conversation gosh well is pep indicated or not um you know really it's that um individualized decision making and then um if someone you know decides that they're going to start pep it's then there's a it's a whole ball of wax in terms of getting the medications on board quickly wow yeah, and, and and it's scary too when you get a needle sti- mm-hmm. needle stick and you're facing that kind of stuff. And you know, I think there's also some confusion about managing the different types of exposures, not just HIV, but Hep B and Hepatitis C. So, yep. how does Pepline? How do Pepline consultants differentiate between those kind of you know, given the varying levels of risk and available mm-hmm. treatments, and guide those healthcare providers accordingly? Yeah, no thanks. I mean, so, you know, though those three viruses um, sort of had been flagged very early on as sort of the key ones to to kind of keep in mind if, if a health worker were to have an occupational um, exposure. And so I think from the get go, you know, once it got to the point where, you know, someone said, ah, we probably need to have like standard clinical guidelines. I think they did try to be really comprehensive because it didn't make sense to have, you know, someone see an HIV provider for the HIV, you know, part of the questions and a different provider to see the rest of it. So I think, um, you know, the guidelines have tried to just um, cover all three. In terms of how we kind of assess this, um, you know, in a kind of organized fashion on the on the PEP line, um, you know, we always just try to remember, like, you know, to to remind callers that there's actually three bloodborne pathogens that they should be assessing for, you know, in both the exposed person and also the source person. And, you know, by and large, all that testing is done with a, you know, blood sample and you can just order the the separate tests and make sure that they're all done at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so from from that standpoint, um, it's really easy to kind of like, you know, consolidate the, the three aspects of the testing. And then um, where things start to differ in our consultation is that, um, you know, we we have the HIV post exposure prophylaxis available. That's sort of this medication, you know, t- you know pill based intervention, um, and that's the one that really probably needs the to be started in the most timely fashion. So, you know, we emphasize that in our consultations. Um, but you know, if there is a question about hepatitis B or hepatitis C, uh, then you know we we start talking about the other preventive indications. You know, we ask. Is the is the worker already vaccinated for hepatitis B, and you know, do we know that they are immune. Mm-hmm. Um, and we go through that. Um, with hepatitis C, in some ways, it's the most straightforward because we don't have PEP for hepatitis C really at this time. And so for hep C, the questions are, okay, well, A, was there hep C exposure? And if so, then this is what the follow-up testing would look like for the mm-hmm. for the worker. And then, you know, this is what the clinical monitoring would look like. And and I feel like that's probably geared towards more, I don't know, maybe it's geared more towards inpatient hospitals, but Something else that caught our eye was the increase in calls from urgent care providers. So it seems like there's a shift happening and that more PEP knowledge is needed outside of that traditional hospital setting. So what are some ways to ensure that urgent care and those other facilities are prepared to handle those exposures? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you know, to be just totally honest, that was something that caught our eye as as well. And I think we we knew we wanted to have this really kind of wrote them long kind of look back period because we know how healthcare has you know just the industry has changed from decade to decade and um you know there's there are you know there continue to be a lot of resources right pulled into kind of hospital-based and inpatient settings but there's a shift really to like you know only kind of prioritize these high acuity things in the inpatient but then you know this whole urgent care industry has grown if you will and so um you know, as hospitals and emergency rooms, I think, 
started to prioritize what they needed to do there, you know, on site, they realized, okay, well, you know, if 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 someone has an exposure and we can get them to a close, you know, urgent care pretty quickly, then then that's where we're going to have, you know, workers go after an exposure. And and you know, sometimes the the providers um that staff those urgent care centers might not be hospital staff, you know, and so they may not have um, gotten a ton of training mm-hmm. um, or or exposure, no pun intended, mm-hmm. to, you mm-hmm. know, bloodborne pathogen, you know, sort of management. Um, and again, we've got the guidelines, but, you know, how do you implement those guidelines on a one to one basis? It's, you know, that, that there's a lot of gray. And I think that's where we try to come in and help. So and while we're on the topic of preparation, I'd love to know more about the training provided to healthcare workers for managing side effects of PEP especially in complex cases like pregnancy or liver conditions? How should these be managed and what resources are available? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, to, to me, because I have been in the HIV field for a number of years, I, I think there is still this kind of um, shroud of um, fear or lack of confidence when, when, when we are prescribing or considering prescribing these antiviral medications. And I think ultimately that that's really a disservice to the entire healthcare um, workforce because um, these medications are really safe. But because, you know, 10, 20 years ago, the message was like only certain kind of specialists can, you know, prescribe these. And it, it, it sort of um, it, it, it set a divide up that I'm not sure was really healthy when it comes down to, you know, PEP evaluations. Um, so, you know, I think for us, we we always want to encourage people to to feel like they can prescribe it, even if they're not an HIV specialist, um, to be familiar with the side effects, which are pretty, you know, easy to remember. It's sort of like GI upset, which is, mm-hmm. you know, a really common side effect with lots of different other kind of medications. <laughs> um, and, and with pregnancy, there's a lot of safety data, um, you know, so so if there's a pregnant um, healthcare worker, I feel very comfortable letting them know, hey, it's safe for you. And um, and it's safe for the baby. You know, I, I don't expect any any kind of adverse outcomes with the pregnancy itself if someone were to um, take the pep while they were pregnant. Um, and then, you know, similarly for, you know, sort of mild liver disease, mild kidney impairment, we've got lots of options. So I don't want that to um, discourage anyone from considering, you know, taking pep if they want to. You mentioned GI issues for side effects. What are some of the other most common side effects of those inter- antiretrovirals that are currently used for the PEP? Mm, okay. Um, so, you know, really, again, it's kind of GI is those common conditions. The one um, maybe kind of safety or caution that we do um, try to be mindful of is kidney toxicity. And so mm-hmm. um, one of the medications that's been used for a long, long time, um, FTC, TDF, we know there's maybe about a 10% chance that someone might experience um, kidney issues while they're on it. Um and what I try to keep in mind is that, you know, if someone's taking PEP, they're only taking it for four weeks. You know, it's not like they're on it permanently. Mm-hmm. Um, and the guidelines have, um, you know, sort of laid out really clearly, okay, well, this is how you would monitor for kidney issues if someone is taking PEP. And um, there's newer medications out now, actually, which I think will, you know, if, if we start prescribing them a lot as PEP, then um, in some ways we can probably put the kidney question aside. Yeah, and... Just to keep following up on that, you know, yeah. your findings indicate a consistent need for reassurance among healthcare workers yeah. that are dealing with dealing with exposures, especially when the source person is known to have HIV or suspected to. So, yeah, why is it so important for healthcare workers to start PEP immediately after exposure, um, potential exposure to HIV, and and how oh. do you think we can better support healthcare providers to feel confident in these situations? Yeah. Um, so in terms of the like timeliness of PEP, I mean, this all rests on, you know, the original kind of animal studies that were done a couple decades ago. And the, the thinking behind, you know, how PEP works is that you get the medications on board, they kind of block all the local um, processes that are happening that then uh, might go on to establish, you know, sort of s- systemic HIV infection. So if you have the preventive medications on board, you really um, sort of stop that chain of events. And and there is time sensitivity. And so that's why the guidelines, you know, to this day really emphasize get the PEP on board as soon as you can, ideally within a couple um, hours if possible. And, you know, they, they give the, the 72-hour window for like even just initiating it. Um, and I 
my thinking has changed on this, honestly. I think get the first doses on board. You can revisit whether you want to stay on it mm-hmm. while you're getting all the other information about the source. And you can always stop it after that first mm-hmm. day or two. Um, and I think if if we shift to that approach, hopefully we'll find more people starting it in a, in kind of that ideal time frame rather than, you know, not even starting at all or having delays. I just want to say thank you for um, saying, you know, your your opinion on that has changed because I think it's so important to be able to do that in medicine and science and kind of look at what we're doing and uh, re refocus our our efforts sometimes. So glad to hear you say that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, I think just sort of acknowledging that, you know, our own thinking around this has has changed because of mm-hmm. how complex um, how complex it's gotten. And when we see data like ours that says, hey, there's a lot of delays that could be, you know, avoidable. It's sort of like, well, how can we rethink the process? How can we rethink the messaging um, so that people who want to be on PEP can start it at least right away and then figure out whether they're going to stay on it? Well, that ties into another aspect of the study, the need to dispel myths about HIV transmission. What are some of the most common misconceptions that you've encountered? And I'm sure there are are many. And how does Pepline help address these? I think um, I kind of put these into buckets because I just try to kind of simplify things for for myself and also when I'm speaking with callers. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of the myths are sort of like, you know, how is HIV transmitted and how is it not? So for example, you know, HIV is not transmitted if there is, um, you know, urine that splashes onto you know, someone's arm, you know, like urine doesn't transmit HIV that way. Um, If someone, um, you know, if there's a bite and if there's no blood in the mouth of the bite or like, and we're just talking saliva, like that is not going to transmit HIV. I mean, there are these like long held myths and fears, I think, around HIV in particular. Um, So that's kind of one back, one bucket of the myths. And then, you know, to be honest, we, 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 we get a we hear a high you know a high level of concern if um you know source persons just you know if there's a, it's kind of anything in their history that might make a caller or might make a worker feel uncomfortable and i think those are the more complex things to try to unpack you know it's sort of like okay well i'm hearing that that this person um might be experiencing homelessness or might be, you know, early in their recovery for substance use disorder. I mean, that doesn't mean that they're also living with HIV. So, you know, it's sort of like I I get that there are certain um, overlapping, you know, disorders and health conditions, but um, I, I, I sort of, I would hate for any of us to feel like we have to assume, you know, that someone might be living or not living with HIV, just, you know, without, with you know, the, the only way to find out is to do a test, right? Mm-hmm. So. And how do you think the healthcare bro- providers can better address these myths? And what role does your team play in this effort? Yeah. Um, well, I think one of the most powerful um, kind of advocacy success stories, maybe that's come out, in, at least in terms of HIV, is, is you know, U equals U. So, you know, even if you do know that someone's living with HIV and if they're taking treatment and their viral load is undetectable, we know that they, you know, they're, they will not transmit HIV sexually to, to their partners. And so from a occupational PEP lens, then we need to say, OK, well, what can we learn and glean from that and then apply it to, uh, you know, needle sticks, for example? Um, it's a really powerful message, you know, if I can say to someone, I do not think that you're going to get HIV from the natal sick because this person is on treatment and their viral load is, is you know, undetectable. Um, we don't have the data, though. And I think that's where we all kind of get hung up sometimes. It's like, well, what can I imply from one setting to another context? It is, speaking of the um, technology, as we're looking ahead, how do you see mm-hmm. the role of teleconsultation evolving, especially with oh, new t- pathogens and evolving clinical guidelines and kind of neat yeah, well, um, you know, I think I think, you know, uh virtual visits, phone visits are here to stay. Um I think there is a, a lot of evidence that kind of affirms that um having the flexibility is appreciated by patients certainly and it, I do think it's appreciated by providers. Um I think as long as we can make sure that all systems are set up to have the same, you know, sort of technological infrastructure that would be ideal so that we're not running into the same issues of, um, you know, 
certain places having resources to be able to do this and other places not having those resources, that, that, that's not going to work. Um, but, you know, for something like PEP, where you really probably aren't going to need too much of an in-person physical assessment, you just need to be able to get the labs at some point, you know, PEP, PEP consultations are, are very, very doable. Um, and if you're working in an area that, um, you know, it, it's a three-hour drive, for example, to see, you know, your provider to, you know, talk about PEP, you don't have to. You can build up, you know, these sort of virtual visits. Um, the key is just to make sure that people can access that visit in a, in a timely fashion if they've had the exposure. Mm -hmm. So with all the advances in HIV treatment and prevention, why do you think PEP remains underutilized even among health care professionals who might be the most aware of the risks? Um, I, I think we need to just keep getting the work. <laughs> it's an option. Um, you know, and, and what we've learned from, um, you know, both sort of the HIV field, but also, you know, like reproductive health, for example, you know, it's like we should have more options because it's not a one size fits all necessarily in terms of what someone um, feels comfortable with with um, for their HIV prevention goals. For occupational PEP, um, you know, this is what we have. And so it's just about like, how can we build the system so that it works for everybody? Yeah, definitely something to think about. So before we wrap up, one last question. Based on what you've seen through the NCCC consultations, what specific steps do you think health care healthcare organizations should take to ensure more timely and effective PEP initiation after an exposure? Um, so protocols are very popular right now. <laughs> And so if you're in an organization that has protocols that work and that, you know, sort of the staff knows that this is just sort of how to do things, then make sure everybody is aware of those protocols, uh, make access easy and mm -hmm. just kind of almost like decentralize it, right? Yeah. Like, you know, again, let's get it out of this um, kind of special specialty mindset. Really, anyone mm -hmm. can do the evaluation. There are very simple questions to ask, very simple tests to order. Um, and um, and make sure that people have follow up. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Uh, you, you've given us a lot of great information. Do you have any other final thoughts? Um, no, just feel free to give us a call. Our PEP line is actually one of several other lines that um, that we operate. Um, so we do a lot of work with HIV prevention, obviously, but um, certainly anyone who is um, caring for someone living with HIV. We've got lots of um, HIV um, consultants to, to talk about treatment. We've got hepatitis C line and also a substance use line, actually. So anyone who has questions around evaluating or, or um, caring for someone who might have a substance use disorder is welcome to call us. Do you have the number that you want to you wanna shout it out? Um, well, I can give you the website because there's lots yeah. of different numbers. Yeah, that'd be great. Great. So it's a uh, NCCC, so like NCCC.ucsf.edu. And if you go to our website, um, you can look at all the all the good things we're doing, all the numbers for our services, and then um, get get some information about our program. Okay, yeah, good. those are Dick. Yeah, and and a lot of great insights here. So it's clear there's a lot more to unpack, but we're so grateful to have had you on the show to help us navigate it. It's complex, but it's a very important topic. So. I appreciate you being on here, just as too, our listeners do. And as I like to say, that's a wrap. Thank you for joining us today. We are Nikki Shore and Jesse Swain, and this is the American Journal of Infection Control podcast, Science into Practice. Thanks for listening and doing your part to prevent infection, because remember, infection prevention is everybody's business. AGIC Science into Practice is created by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology with input from the APIC Center of Research, Practice, and Innovation. And Pat Stone and Jean Brandt at AGIC and APIC staff, Rebecca Bartles, Rhea Gupta, Bobby Golshin, and Liz Garman. We work in partnership with Human Factor and Audio Text Blake Alton and Carolyn Schneer. To hear other AGIC episodes and to access information about this podcast and the field of infection prevention and control, go to our website, agicscienceintopractice.org. That's A-J-I-C, scienceintopractice.org. 